So, um, hello. So Hi. Uh, this time we have Dave Haney in the interview. Um, he is known for for being a former hardware engineer for Commodore, and he he also engineered and developed the Amiga computer and the Commodore C128. So, right. um, so would you please tell us a bit about what you did back then and what you do nowadays and who you are exactly? Um, well, I'm Dave Haney. I, uh, um, let's see, I started at Commodore in 1983, um, originally part of the TED project, which gave us the um, Commodore 16 and uh, 116 and um, the plus four and that, which was, that was kind of a weird project because the original idea of that was to make a computer that was a rival to the Sinclair that um, was being sold in the country, in this country under the Timex name, um, you know, a hundred dollar computer. And it kind of got out of control after Jack Tramiel left. Um, after that, Commodore 128 was the second attempt to hmm. make a follow on to the Commodore 64. The first one didn't work. <laughs> um, that was other people, other people were involved. And um, from there, after Commodore bought the Amiga, I got invited to help out on Amiga. Um, originally, the, uh, the guys in Westchester who had started the A500, um, George Robbins and Bob Welland, were supposed to, they had been, the, they had been in charge of the Commodore um, 900, which are, was our um, megapixel Linux machine, except it wasn't really Linux. It was a thing called Coherent, which was a copy of um, Unix kind of like Linux is today, uh, but, uh, but not, not open source. It was a private product. Anyway, it was, it, they, that project had been canceled because of the Amiga. So they decided that they were going to figure out how to make a cheaper Amiga. And they did. And they, but they were, they had previously been the high end guys. Of course, I had been on the Commodore 128 as a low end guy. So I was supposed to take over the Commodore 500 only George didn't want to let go of the Commodore 500 because it was his baby. <laughs> so they put me on the 2000 instead. And, um, from there, um, Amiga 3000, Amiga 4000, and um, after Commodore, I've just been, in, until last summer, I was doing a series of startup companies. Um, currently, I'm working for a company called Ragent, which actually has 50 people, so it's like a giant company. Um, mm -hmm. Doing, the la my last startup company started doing a robotics project that was canceled. Then we built the, uh, the best RC controller for toy cars, you know, well, you know, high-end RC hobbyist cars. They're not really, they're not, you know, you spend a lot of money on them. They're probably not toys to you. Um, <laughs> and um, from there, um, that led to controlling robots for, um, we, our, we, built a ro a, a, we built a professional version of the hobbyist controller for controlling robots. We got that into five or six different robot companies Unfortunately, almost every robot company is also a startup company, so we didn't make a lot of money at that. Um, we did get it into a gov program. They they decided they wanted to make a bomb finding and destroying robot for really cheap. As a regular robot costs about one hundred and twenty five, hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The kind they've been using, like the iRobot Packbot, which you see in some of those, you, know, you see those on TV or um, in movies because they look really cool, <laughs> but um, they're expensive. Um, ours was five thousand dollars. We we co-developed it. I did all the electronics on it. Those went into um, various war zones. They were used by special forces. They some of them were used by uh, police and rescue teams. Um, but mostly the mostly the police and rescue teams are putting our radios and other robots. And then from there, we built a, an even better radio. But it's more of a it's it's more modern. It's it's all IP based. So it's essentially it's essentially like a router. Only it's a mesh router, so every every node talks to every other node, and they you, you sort of build ad hoc networks based on just every radio being a repeater as well as a as well as a radio, and that was a good idea. But the company decided on yet another project they wanted to do, which was entirely software for Windows. So I left and went to a company that does that same kind of digital radio, uh, which is Ragent, and that's where I am now. Um, along with various other outside projects that really aren't technical. Um, but 
I see. Um, but that, that's kind of what I'm doing today. <laughs> so uh, going back to the beginning, you, you were starting at, as a, a hardware engineer at Commodore. Um, and I wonder, how did you actually get the idea to become um, a hardware engineer? I mean, how do you get this job? How did you get the idea to go into this kind of stuff to do? Well, in, when, when I was in high school, I was um, actually even before, before high school. When I was about 12, my dad brought home a computer that wasn't really a computer. It was a Hewlett Packard calculator that was that was like this. It was a big monster. It was it weighed about 30, 40 pounds, and it, it had a CRT and it showed you three registers, and it had little magnetic cards you could write programs on. And as a 12 year old, I started playing around with it. He brought it home to work on his taxes, <laughs> way before they had any tax software or anything like that. And so I, uh, I started playing around with this and learned there, was, there were a couple games on cartridges, really, really simple games. And um, <coughs> once, uh, once I played with it, I got really bored with those games fast and started modifying them and making my own. That computer had to go back, but eventually he brought home a terminal every weekend, which was, it was a TI Silent 700. It prints it on thermal paper. He'd bring home a computer terminal and a roll of paper and let me go onto his account at Bell Labs. Um, because he he never used a computer at that point he he didn't uh, he didn't use computers but he had he was he ran a department so he had a com he had access to the computer and nobody used it on the weekend because back then Bell Labs was very researchy and they they weren't on under commercial pressure so it was a pretty relaxed place to work um, I mean they had an, one invention for every day they were around but the, you know a lot of smart people worked there but they didn't work on the weekends too much so I got to use the computer on the weekends and I taught myself basic and a little bit of Fortran. And um, not too long after this, I was taking courses in school, and my uh, my best friend Scott got a uh, got a Commodore Pet. Um, his his grandfather had had given him money to get a computer, a home computer, and we went to uh, the islands of Manhattan, and there was one store that had the Commodore Pet. It was it was it wasn't really a store. It was kind of like a one room in an office building, and on one side of the room they had Commodore Pet, and the other side they had the 4K Apple II. I think I was about, what was it, 1977, so I was like 16, and, um, and Scott bought the, uh, the PET, and I already knew how to program it, so I got a lot of time on PET, and cur curiously enough, that was my first, the first exposure real to, really to a home computer was on the, on the PET. Um, a year later, my grandfather died and left me some money, and I went and bought a computer, but it wasn't the PET, it was, it was a thing called an Exidy Sorcerer. Um, which was uh, not very successful. <laughs> um, and I wrote software for that. And I was always working on electronics too. I had electronics projects. In, I think in fourth grade, I, I, did a, uh, I built a, uh, an AM radio as a, as a uh, project for, uh, um, <clears throat> for um, a class. Uh, late, when, one year, a few years later, I entered a science fair. I originally tried to build a laser, but I couldn't get the right parts. So I ended up building a... Um, uh, a magnetic, uh, a magnetic data transfer thing that's kind of like what RFID is today, but I didn't really know what to do with it. They weren't all that impressed because they didn't understand it. Um, so I was always, I was messing around with electronics. So when it came time to go to college, um, couldn't quite decide between software and hardware. So I signed up for electrical engineering, and then I decided to double major in electrical engineering and uh, math slash computer science. And I almost triple majored in psychology, but I couldn't quite, even with some overloads, I couldn't quite get all the sort courses in the right order to finish all three as majors. So I only took five courses in, co this is cognitive psychology. That's like, thing, th basically how the brain works, which sort of falls into a lot of what you do in computer programming if you're using, if you're using cognitive models. You know, you want to make your machine act smarter, you should build it kind of the way people do things. So. So right out of college, I, I had a couple applications. I probably would have gone to work for Bell Labs. I worked for them for two summers, only that was the year of the AT&T breakup, and they weren't hiring anybody. So um, I put out my resume, and I had a couple offers, but I ended up working at General Electric in Philadelphia, supposed to be working on things like the space shuttle, because that's how they brought you in. But it turns out it was all military stuff that they had. You know, That was kind of all they were working on. And I, I didn't really want to build bombs because there were enough bombs already so I, um, I it took me a little while to get up the nerve to say I'm just going to leave this place because you know you 
you're you're there for your first real job out of college. You don't necessarily quit the you know the second day you're there. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so I I put out a resume to one headhunter, you know, one one placement agency on a Tuesday. They called me up Thursday at work. Um, said, can you come in for an interview? Sure, when today. So I came in. I was actually um, I was kind of rebelling against one thing at General Electric was that when you got there. Um, this was the largest hiring of people outside the company they had done in 15 years because they created a new department called computational design. Because at General Electric, at least at that time, I'm sure it's changed since, You were, if you were a hardware person, you were a hardware person. If you're a software person, you're a software person. You weren't allowed to do both, ever. They had this huge wall between hardware and software, which I thought was the stupidest thing known to mankind because it's kind of two pieces of the same thing. I mean, if you're designing a system, you don't necessarily know if it's a big system, which pieces are hardware, which pieces are software. And of course, it got even murkier once FPGAs came along, because they have properties of both. But anyway, this was a little before FPGAs. And um, so, the, but I saw these, these college kids come in like me, and one by one, they sort of faded into the background and started looking like everybody else. <laughs> and I didn't really want to, I wasn't really in for this whole corporate not doing much work thing. They had they had dozens of us on one Vax computer doing simulations. And if you know any about anything about simulations, that's one of the most compute intensive tasks you can get. So um, you, you could put your job in and wait hours for the simulation result to come back. And I was working on the simulator itself. So I, had, I was actually trying to fix the simulator. There were some problems with it. And it was a, it was a hardware simulator written in software. And I had even learned to hack the system so I could get my, my stuff boosted up in higher priorities. And I was still kind of bored, and I was reading novels at work, waiting for the things to finish. And I was learning to, I was putting out all kinds of uh, sub jobs to run a bunch of stuff at the same time. And I'm not sure if everybody else was doing that, but I kind of doubt it. But anyway, I got bored with this. So I put out my resume. I was wearing a homemade shirt that day, in fact. And I went to, um, I went to this office in uh, Philadelphia, somewhere around there. And... Um, I met the. I was sit. I w walked into the waiting room, and there's this long-haired guy across from me. He looks. He's a little older than me, but he he looked. Uh, you know, I'm like, are you here? You here for interview too? And he says, kind of. And um, <laughs> then they br they brought me in, brought me in to uh, talk to Joe Krizuki, who was the head of um, engineering at Commodore. And I talked to Joe Krizuki for a little while, and and then they brought me into the room, and there there was that other guy. With the with long hair and John Lennon glasses, and that was Bill Hurd, who um, asked me some really tough questions and then hired me. And um, basically, I uh, quit General Electric and was at Commodore a week later. And I was there for 11 and a half years, basically until um, June of '94, when they went out of business. Well, they had gone out of business in April of '94. I hung around for a little while. And then uh, Scala was asking me very, very much, you've got to come work for us. you got to come work for us. So that's when I went to Scala after that. So I'm sure you probably have some commenter questions. So let's not get too far ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So what I wonder is, yeah. you, you said you, you also played around with the pad and so on. So what, what did it mean for you that, you that you started working at the company Commodore and um, knowing that you were using a pad before, which was invented by Jack Paddle in the, I think it was 1977 or something, also at Commodore. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he had developed it at 76. It came out in 77. Yeah, yeah, I was. That's what I wanted to do. I, you know, I was, I had the, I had a home. You know, I was, I was part of that early, you know, year, those early years of tinkering around with home computers, and you know, the idea that I got to actually make my next toy was pretty hot. You know, I was really, you know, that was that was the great, that was the best job. It's still that was the best job ever. Um, it was, uh, and Commodore was run pretty. It, there were times, but it was run pretty well. If you had a project you wanted to work on, you could pretty much work on it. Especially after, you know, I proved myself on a number of things. There was one year I had four different projects, none of which were official products. They were just, you know, for learning things, for experimentation. Um, so it was, it was a real good place to work. It was, it was actually run, I didn't know it at the time, but it was run a lot like some startup companies. It was like, it was a startup company with money. Not a lot of money. They didn't hire enough people for anything. But they did have, uh, they had a pretty good attitude about, um, about, you know, working. And everybody there was, I mean, it was tough. If you, if you weren't very good, you, you wouldn't last. But um, everybody there was really dedicated to, you know, making the best personal computer they could. 
and we you know we saw our our fairly small company by you know by the standards of the day um, doing things better than Apple and doing things better than IBM and well Atari you know they were kind of a joke anyway by then. <laughs> <laughs> So I remember I was reading the book, The The Rise and Fall of Commodore, and there was one paragraph which which um, <laughs> mentioned that um, before you started on the C128, you started on other computers, at the, as you said before. And I remember and that it was written that you said um, the other computers are not compatible to the Commodore C64 and other Commodore computers. Well, this will never work on the market. I have to make a computer that is successor of a C64 that is compatible with it and still better um, than than the Commodore C64. So, um, so, and and I I also read in the book that you you really tried hard to make it. 99 first and compatible and there are still some differences and there are still programs that only run on the original Commodore 64 and not on the uh, C64 mode of the C128. So if you could tell us a bit about this episode of computers you made that were not compatible and um, how it turned out the, to be the Commodore 128 in the end. Well, the, the Commodore 128 was actually a separate project. We made, the first one I worked on was the Plus 4, and that was, that was never intended to compete with the Commodore 64. When we, we, the, the, the folks who made that up, they had one chip that did the video and the sound. Um, they had you know, taken kind of the idea of the Commodore 64 architecture and changed it to make it cheaper. Um, and added more colors because every time you do something, you know, like, okay, well, we can do this. It'll be cool to, you know, to, to do something you know, a little bit better at some, you know, one thing or another. Um, so it had a, a larger color palette, but um, the original plan was that it was just going to be a $100 computer. And at that time, the Commodore 64 was selling for, I don't know, 250 or 300 or something like that, maybe 500. I, I, you know, I remember exactly what, what it cost at retail then. But the idea was that we were worried about, you know, the Commodore was worried about other, com other computers competing below the level of the Commodore 64. Because, you know, Commodore was supposed to have the cheapest computer around. And um, the problem was that, you know, the various managers um, decided that maybe, you know, to, to, uh, to not do that and to make the computers more, you know, to make the one we were working on more expensive, which was, yeah, it was kind of a stupid idea because it, it wasn't, it couldn't be compatible with the Commodore 64 and still be made that much cheaper. But, you know, it was, it, you know, you had basic, in fact, it had, a, you know, it had a new basic, basic five, I think it was, which... It, a lot of what went into the plus four wound up in the Commodore 128 as well, um, but you couldn't you couldn't take the um, you couldn't take the whole Commodore 64 and make it cheaper at that time. I mean, we did that, but that was you know that was still the Commodore 64. It wasn't a separate computer. So you know the problem was when they made when they put out the plus four, they priced it basically the same as the Commodore 64. And yeah, my quote was that you know nobody else could compete with the Commodore 64. You know, why why would you know why did Commodore think they could? <laughs> because you know if you're going to buy a computer, the, you know the Commodore 64 was not just popular because it was a good computer. It's popular because there are like you know tens of thousands of programs for it, and every you know and all you know if you were a kid growing up then your friend probably had a Commodore 64. You knew somebody else who had one. You know you all played the same games. If you had cartridges, you could trade them. If you had programs, you could probably run their programs because right then, yeah, you know, back then everything ran off a of floppy. Um, you know, if you if you were insidious, you could get the uh, the you know the nibble copiers and uh, co you know make a copy of everybody's disk. So it was you know that was that was keeping the Commodore sixty four um, uh, you know viable. Um, so the other computers just really couldn't compete. Um, so when we went to the Commodore 128. It was uh, it was uh, you know it was decided within the company, and Bill Hurd actually started on it. And I since I'd worked with him on the Plus Four, about a month into that, he decided he needed more help and got me onto the Commodore 128 project as well. And uh, one of my main jobs on the Commodore 128 was making sure things were compatible. But there only there's only so much you could do. There were, basically if you if you wrote a proper Commodore 64 program, it runs on the 128. There are a couple people, you know, a couple programs that did bad things that screwed things up, and you know, a few changes. Like for instance, there 
there were a couple extra registers in the VIC chip. And we found a couple programs, and we could usually put them on a logic analyzer and find out what they were doing. And there were a couple programs that did block copies of values to registers, and their counter was wrong. And so they ended up writing garbage into these extra registers on the VIC chip. And uh, one of those registers like, would put it into 2 megahertz mode. And when you got into 2 megahertz mode, um, VIC stopped doing memory fetches, but it would, you could still see the display. So, in fact, people were using that as a debugger. As you turn on the, you turn on the 2 megahertz mode, and you just see basically random bus traffic show up on your screen. <laughs> and um, that, would, that would kill the game because, it, you know, and there were a few other little things like that. Um, I had done a bunch of things to change the uh, to change the signals on the on the expansion port to look more like the Commodore 64 signals, but there were still a few things. That, there were some really really stupid ideas that people had done in hardware that just happened to work in a Commodore 64 that we couldn't replicate. Um, there was one one program that um, early on um, there was this a graphics program from Island Graphics, and it started up. And it was, you know, it was just, just this, you know, it had, like, you know, like most programs, it had the startup message kind of thing. And it was just, it would come up and say Island Graphics, and um, it would, uh, it would start painting the Island Graphics using the, gra you know, using the painting primitives of the program. And originally, on, when it was running on the 128 in Commodore 64 mode, it went to dot the I, and it missed because the I was now the pixels were like one line higher, so. That flood fill filled the entire background and ended up erasing a bunch of stuff. And then another graphics operation came along and failed to do what it was supposed to do. Before you knew it, there was no. Um, it was just. It was a mess because it was all getting. Uh, it, it was. It took twenty or thirty minutes for the program to start up. So um, to fix that, um, I, we actually went to a double size ROM. And when you're in Commodore 64 mode, you get the old characters, and when you're Commodore 128 mode, you get the new characters. I mean, that was that was the extent of you know where really what happened on the Commodore 64 was that there <laughs> some programs that did so many crazy things that even the software was essentially part of the hardware. <laughs> you know, you couldn't change much of anything without breaking stuff. You couldn't even fix bugs because everybody depended on those bugs being there or they worked around them in some way that was very specific to the code. I mean, there were programs that jumped into the middle of the ROM to save a few bytes here and there. It's really, you know, it's really just, a, it was a product of the ages. So my next question is, is the Commodore 64 mode um, like like a copy of the Commodore 64 because I know that there are still some programs that are not compatible with the C128 or some versions of the C128 though there even seems to be some differences between the different models of the C uh, C128 I mean there are so many different models out there even one that is yeah. the even one that is a metal case if I remember correctly I'm not sure about a metal case, but there there are at least five different motherboards, um, which were major revisions. They 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 revised it a couple of times. I was actually in charge of one of those, the last one, which was the Commodore Rev E, Commodore 64 Rev E. Um, it had a big gate array on it that basically put it, it, it took in just about everything except for the CPU and the SID chip. Um, you know, because the last version of the Commodore 64, I I, I recall them saying it cost about thirty five dollars to make. It, it, you know, including manufacturing, put in a box and ready to ship to the store, $35, which is pretty amazing. But, you know, they were making a million a year. So, you know, your cost goes down when you make a million of, some, of anything. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it was, it was, it was, well, it was a VIC chip. It was, a, it was the VIC-3 chip in the, in the 128, which was a, you know, it, it was a modification of the original VIC chip, but everything in there was the same. It just had a little bit of extra stuff in it. Um, like I was saying, you know, if there, if you wrote, if, if it was sloppy programming, it wouldn't be compatible between. If you counted on some really stupid things, you could probably make it fail on one version of the Commodore 64 and not another. But um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't what, it wasn't a normal thing to happen. It was, you know, somebody's doing something stupid. <laughs> I see. Um, so actually, there's also a third mode that people seldom use. That was a CPM mode. And I rem if I rem if I remember correctly, it was like that that it really failed a lot. I mean, there was not a lot of software for the CPM mode, and it 
I remember there was even a cartridge for the C64 that, that enabled it to, to run CPM programs, but that wasn't successful either. So what was the idea of that mode and why did you think it wasn't so successful? And um, in general, most of those 128 computers were used in C64 mode most of, no, most of the time, actually. Yeah, well, the idea behind CPM was that the CPM on the on the C CPM cartridge for the Commodore sixty four basically didn't work because the the uh, the, the way DMA worked on the C sixty four was messed up. Um, we we uh, we got it. We, the the C one twenty eight got CPM mode basically because it was a very cheap way of adding a. Um, the the idea was that there there was actually a lot of software out there for this for the uh, for CPM, not no games or anything. It was all business software. So you know you had DBase and you had WordPerfect and you know all this all these programs that had been accepted in business that ran on CPM and um, when when you put the C128 into CPM mode it could read like you know dozens of different CPM machine disks because there was no standard there was a lot all these different very very slightly different versions of uh, of um, of disk format we could read Kpro disks and Osborne disks and a bunch of others and um, it was, you know, it was 80 column software for business. That was the idea is that if you wanted to use this for, um, you know, for, for that sort of thing, you immediately had all this 80 column software you could get that used the, that used the 8563 chip. And they were thinking that, well, you know, there's not going to be that much software for, uh, for C128 mode to start with. So we're, we'll offer this as well. And some people used it. I actually played around with it for a little bit. But, it, you know, it was, it was a very, very different thing than what the normal Commodore mode was. Um, and of course, see the other problem. Of course, is that if you're writing a game for 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 the Commodore 64, um, you know, are you really going to write one just for the 128? Probably not, because you then you're you know we sold you know how many 30, 20 or 30 million Commodore 64s and a total of about six million Commodore 128. So um, you know you weren't going to sell you weren't you're limiting your market unless you're going to do something that's, you know, that really, really makes, the, you know, that's just that much better that it has to run in Commodore 60, has to run in 128 mode. Um, so, you know, it, you know, there's only, you know, you, if, it, it, you know, you can improve something, but when you improve it, you know, you, you leave behind what was there before, right? So um, it, it kind of makes sense that there wasn't as much, there weren't as many things that used either Commodore 64 mode. Um, by then, you know, the IBM PC was kind of taking over for CPM in the business world. Um, but we weren't going to, we weren't, you know, it was, it was the technology at that time wouldn't let. One, one good thing about um, CPM that they lost with uh, MS DOS was that CPM was all written kind of to abstractions. So, you know, your, your graphics, your terminals, it was all text mode, but it was done, um, it didn't care what the hardware was. And when you went to, when, when the IBM PC came along, you actually, you really, really, really had to clone the IBM PC because everyone was banging registers. And it was actually kind of a big step backwards that if you weren't 100% PC compatible, you couldn't run a lot of programs. And so, um, you know, which is of course, you know, it was true of the Commodore 64 too, but that was, you know, some, you know that, was, that was a different era too. Um, so CPM, you know, we could, we could pretty much run anything that would run on a K-Pro. That was kind of our goal because that had been the, that had been the most popular CPM machine at the time at least. And um, it worked, you know, just, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily the thing that most Commodore 64ers wanted to use because they were, you know, they're, they're used to what they're, you know, what the C64 did. It was mostly games. Um, I, my wife actually wrote her uh, senior thesis on the Commodore 64 in OmniWriter. So, I mean, you can use it for real work. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, the C128 has a better lay, lay, layout on the keyboard and is flat and so on. Um, so let me let me pick up your your argument that the CPM mode a cartridge for the C64 didn't really work. <laughs> so if you knew it wouldn't really work, why did you actually invent it at Commodore? I mean, what was the idea, and how I, did how, I? I don't think that I don't actually know who worked on that. It was way before my time, um, but um, yeah, I don't know. They 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 had problems with it. It was I guess some people just didn't understand why DMA on the Commodore sixty four was broken. 
so they didn't understand that it wasn't always going to work. Um, I don't really, I don't really know. It was, it was a product that was released for a very short time and then canceled. That means that the CPM cartridge really didn't work well, and some programs or most programs didn't even run on it, right? The other problem was even if you had it, how are you going to get how are you going to run CPM programs on your drive because uh, 1541 couldn't read CPM disks, 1571 could. <laughs> so they hadn't really thought about they hadn't thought if even if CPM was a good idea, the way they did it with that cartridge was just a bad idea. I see. Um, so, um, do you know actually something about the keyboard layout? I mean, it it looked a bit like um, to me it looks a bit more professional and like an Amiga computer or something. If you if you look from the shape and the uh, case, how how did that it was happen? It, it was inspired probably by we were all using deck terminals which had good keyboards that are actually much better than the IBM PC keyboard because they don't have a gigantic caps lock key that no one needs. Um, but that's, that's kind of where the Commodore 64 key, or Commodore 128 keyboard came from. That was, that was the, the inspiration was that was the, uh, like the VT100 and uh, that, that sort of thing that we had, we had these terminals that, you know, that all, we all used to talk to our big computers back at Commodore. We had Unix machines and we had VAX machines and, um, that's that that was that was where you know we all like those keyboards so that was kind of the idea it's not the same keyboard but it's just, you know that was that was our mechanical designers use that as kind of the model mm -hmm. another thing that would interest me is uh, how did it happen that um the that the earlier or the most of the 128 had the the old sit chip um the 6581 and some models suddenly got the um, 8580 SID chip. How did that happen? Um, the, the original SID chip, well, the, the, pro the difference with the two SID chips was that the, the original one was a 12 volt, needed 12 volts, and the, the new one needed, could run off of 9 volts. And um, the original, originally, it, the 9 volt SID chip wasn't done yet when it was time to ship the Commodore 64. They hadn't worked out all the bugs, so the early ones shipped with an older version. Um, that was, you know, it was just, that was really the reason it was, the, you know, it was, the goal was to, you know, was to make it better and use less power. And, and I, you know, I don't really know that much if they changed anything in the chip itself, but it was, it was a new process. I mean, part of it was just moving forward technologically, you know, 85 was Commodore's HMOS 2 product pro, you know, process and 65 is the old original NMOS process. And they wanted to get everything out of NMOS as quickly as they could, just because they didn't want to run those chips anymore. I see. So uh, there might not have been it. That so you know it, it wasn't necessarily you know it wasn't necessarily changing anything in the SID chip. It was just moving it to a newer technology, a smaller chip. You know, makes it cheaper. Makes you know we get more yield. Whatever it was. So um, you were you were saying that um, that that you put a lot of work into making things compatible with the C C64. So I wonder, did you did you see the demos that were released, especially for the C um, for the C128 for the 80 columns mode? I mean, there were some dumb demos by demo groups, not not a lot, maybe two or three. Did you did you look at that? Did you ever spend time and see what? Demo um, coders and graphicians uh, did with your hardware. Uh, yeah, actually, there's a funny story there. In that, um, when the when we did the the eighty eighty five sixty three was was done by this guy Kim Eckert, and it was it was a modif it was an update of an older design, and um, he did not know that that chip had a bitmap mode. <laughs> Even though he was the designer, he didn't read. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a design from scratch. So, um, and so we did not know that there that that chip had a bitmap mode. It wasn't documented anywhere. But um, some some hackers found out that there that you could put it into gra you know full graphics mode, and um, and that was good. I mean, that was great. In fact, once once that got discovered and started getting used, we changed the amount of memory. So newer, newer 128s had, had 64K of memory instead of 16K of memory, so you could do more with the graphics. I see, yes. I think there's also... 
there was also yeah. a, a manual on the internet how you could upgrade your your uh, memory. Yeah, yeah, you could take the old chips out and put the new ones in. And it, I think it turned out too that after about a year or so, the the, the smaller chip was just getting hard to find. You know, because Commodore Commodore isn't doesn't usually give you something for nothing, but in that case, it was it was probably the same price. And once there was a use for it, it didn't make sense to use the other price, you know, the older chip anymore. Um, that chip that chip had been a big problem too. We um, when when Mr. Eckert was on vacation, in, uh, um, uh right before CES in 1984, um, there were a bunch of us uh, staying around Christmas and, and uh, New Year's trying to get. A couple of those chips to work for CES. Um, there, there were some timing issues, and Bill Hurd and Dave Diorio, Dave Diorio is the guy who designed the VIC chip, came up with this uh, synchronization tower. A tower, we, a Commodore, a tower is something you plug into a chip socket and then put a whole bunch of other chips on it to make that to make the whole board work like the chip is supposed to work. That you know, you only see those when either when you've got a prototype or when you've got a chip that doesn't work quite properly. Um, and so they built this tower that allowed you to phase lock. The problem was that the 80, 80 comp chip didn't synchronize with the rest of the system, and I discovered early on that you kind of had to tell it twice. You told it, you told it to do something once; it wouldn't necessarily do it. Maybe the second time you told it, it would actually do it. Maybe not. It was kind of random, and that's because it wasn't synchronized properly. Um, and um, so for CES, there was also some heat problems and all. So we were we we spent we were going through thousands of chips. It was me and 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 some of the. Uh, one of, one of the managers in, in the chip group were going through like thousands of chips trying to find the golden 25 chips that we could take to uh, the CES show. And so we got to the CES show, and, but we knew that some of them were, some of them had really good video and some of them just had kind of crappy video, but it was good enough to like boot the computer. And before you know it, all the marketing people are like turning, you know, running the computers and we had them set up for different things. So, you know, here's the ones for business, here's the ones for this, here's the ones for that. These guys were changing the software and, and I was running around with a little plastic tweaking tool because what happened was when you, when you, if you, if the chip wasn't synchronized properly, the, the C128 wouldn't boot and the phase lock tower had to be dialed in to let that happen. And it worked fine as long as you kept it on. But if you like, if you rebooted the computer, or no, if you rebooted, it was fine. If you power cycled it, it wasn't. It, this the the fact that the tower had heated up meant that it was going to synchronize differently. So you had to resync it. Um, so these guys were constantly this whole show. They were messing with these things, and I was running around with a plastic tool and a can of freeze spray to get them all. You know, every time they broke one, to get it synchronized again and powered up. So mm -hmm. of course that wasn't something anyone was supposed to see. It was supposed. You know, when you go to a show, you're supposed to have. Oh yeah, here's our great new computer. We're making millions of them, <laughs> but we weren't. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that was that. That chip got fixed not too long after that. I see. But um, for the, yeah. You say. You continue. You want to say uh, something? I was just saying for, for the for the show that was that was really the main problem left in the Commodore Commodore 128 at that point, which you know wasn't bad considering that we had um, we a year later we were shipping. I see. Um, Actually, at, six months later is when it shipped. Yeah. Ah. Actually, at the beginning you were mentioning that. You found it stupid that at your old place you worked, there was a separate um, a wall between hardware and software. So did you also some software design for the for the your Com Commodore computers you were involved with? I didn't do I not software design. I did I did a lot of things like um, you know like early hard you know when you're when you're developing hardware you often need software to test it and run it and stuff like that. So I I got. I was I was programming the uh, the 80 column chip pretty early on. Um, you know, I had figured out that there was some kind of problem. Um, I didn't, you know, I had I hadn't I you know I didn't know exactly what it was. So late, late, later on, um, Bill and Dave got in there as well and figured out exactly what the problem was. Um, I you know it was it was more later on in the Amiga years that I was doing a lot more um, software. Um, but I mean, part of it is not just that; it's the fact that you you know that so hardware and software people are co-designing a system right you you know you you want to talk to the software people and build them the thing they want to program 
because usually software is going to be the problem anyway. And the chip designers too, you know, the chip designers, you know, I want to talk to the chip designer if he's making a chip for me. So I, because I'm the one who has to make that chip work in the system, then the software guys have to come along and make my chips do something, you know, make my hardware do something. So, you know, having everybody talk to one another and, and understand, different, you know, and understand, you know, at least enough of each other's area is, uh, is really critical to making things happen well and happen fast. And if you put a walls between them, you get people fighting each other or you get, you know, hardware guys making really stupid mistakes that put the, you know, the software people through hell for no reason at all. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Um, so is there one thing or maybe two things you always wanted to make in this uh, C128 to make it better, but you weren't able to or you weren't allowed to? Well... Yeah, I mean, it, just in general, we would have liked to have done a whole lot. We would have liked to make it a whole lot better with, you know, with like the VIC chip. We were allowed to make some changes, but we weren't allowed to like make whole new graphics modes. And you know, we weren't allowed to make it a lot more powerful. We would have liked to have done that. Um, the MMU would have would have been nice to support more memory. I mean, there were a bunch of things that um, that we, you know, that would have been nice to do, but we had, you know, pretty limited resources. I mean, if you look at if you look at what Bill Gardai did in the uh, Commodore uh, in the in the C sixty five, this famous C sixty five that came out in the Amiga years, except it wasn't actually ever released. Um, you know, he he for some reason had a lot more chip facilities available back then. I guess just you know the the march of technology, nobody was using that level, you know, that, that, that wasn't that important, that those processes weren't, weren't expensive or important any, enough anymore. And, um, you know, but when, in our, in our era, when we started the 128, there were just, there's a limit to what they were going to allow us to do. Um, I think part of the problem at the time too, was that there had been a previous project to make a Commodore 64 replacement, um, that had some very bad ideas in it and it never worked. Um, it was a little bit like if I don't know if you remember uh, in the in the Commodore um, you know in the business line line of products there had been the B one twenty eight which was um, it was just like it was like one of, you know sort of more more similar to the Pets and it had um, it had some extra memory in it and it used, it did bank switching in kind of a stupid way and they were going to do that as well in the uh, in in the the follow on that, that was being worked on and I I don't even remember who was working on that because that was that that had, that project had been canceled before I came to work at Commodore so. Um, I didn't know that much about it, other than that they were they were doing some really kind of stupid things to bank switch. The way the way the Commodore 128 MMU worked was actually one of the best systems for banking memory anybody had ever come up with. <laughs> um, it, we were really happy with it. It was you know it, it gave the programmers exactly what they needed, and part of the reason that was designed that way is because the chip designers were talking to the software guys, and they they gave them some resources like you know like the like the configuration registers. So that they could very quickly switch between memory configurations, rather than having to, you know, to load up a bunch of things all at once. And you know, particularly if you're changing a mode where your memory might go away, it you know, it's better to be able to have that as controllable as possible. Mm -hmm. So, in in regards to that, what do you think about the DTV that was developed by Jerry Ellsworth back in 2004? You know that um, Commodore 64 and a joystick that that was pretty successful yeah. and had much more color available and so on, um, except of course for the for the SID chip that was not having register, uh, not having filters and so on. And sounded pretty badly compared to the original thing. Yeah. But what but what do you think about this achievement? I mean, I mean, um, she she even made a Commodore One computer from from scratch. I mean, she redeveloped yeah. the Commodore. So, what do you think about those projects she did, the Commodore One and the DTV, with with more um, possibilities technically? Oh, Jerry's amazing. She yeah, she she did what took like an entire group at Commodore. Um, and, you know, I mean, part, you know, it's good that the technology has advanced to the point where that's possible because doing it, doing the original, the Commodore one was done with FPGAs where, you know, again, like I was saying earlier, the hardware becomes a little bit more like software and that you're designing hardware in, in ways that makes it very easy to change it. And, um, but yeah, she did it. She did her homework too. She talked to just about everybody who had worked on the Commodore 128 or the Commodore 64. She, you know, she got it. She re rebuilt the whole thing in an FPGA, um, except for the CPU. And then I think the uh, 
the joystick version actually had its own CPU. Um, I think, I, as I recall, they built a RISC processor that emulated the Commodore 60, emulated the 6502 because that was easier. Or it uses it used fewer gates than actually building a 6502 clone in there. But other than that, it was, I mean, it was, it was a pretty cool idea. I just, you know, I heard she got ripped off by the uh, Chinese on that, which was a shame. But, um, yeah, it was, it was a major accomplishment. It was, um, you know, there, there haven't been many things done like that where one person, you know, kind of recreates this, you know, this, this pro thing that had before, before been this engineering project that required you know, dozens of people. <laughs> So you are, I see you are very informed. So you are still keeping track of, of what are doing people nowadays with your computers and developments and well clones. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah so a little keep, bit. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I, yeah. I see. Um, so let's speak about your next, um, big project. That was the Amiga. And, um, if I remember correctly, I've I've read I no I've I've read somewhere that um, actually for example the Ju Jurassic Park movie um, used uh, an Amiga to render all the graphics the 3D graphics and the dinosaur models and so on. Um, so so tell us a bit about this um, achievement with the Amiga and why why it was um, so much better in your in your perspective compared to other computers, for example, the Atari, which you said wasn't so great? Well, the, the Atari was actually, um, the thing about the Atari ST was that kind, that was kind of ripped off from Commodore. When, when Jack Tremiel was leaving, a bunch of his engineers were leaving, they, they had supposedly been working on a, uh, a, a secret Skunk Works project outside of Commodore, but that was, it was what they were doing you know, I mean, again, I'm not sure how much of this was ever documented, but supposedly they're working on a 60, 68,000 project, which was really supposed to take kind of the idea of what the Commodore 900 was in terms of the way that architecture went and turn it into a 68,000 computer that might be, you know, more, more usable. And when they all left for Atari, that project vanished. And that's, as far as we know, that's where the Commodore ST, I mean, the, the, um, the, the Atari ST came from. And it wasn't, you know, it's not like it was a bad design or anything. It just, you know, it was, it was very much like, um, you know, it was very much like other computers. The Amiga was completely different. Um, you know, the, the Amiga used, you know, it used heavy uses of DNA, DMA, the graphics system, and just the way all that memory architecture changed between the three chips, the slot allocations. I mean, it was just, you, you were doing a whole lot more with, you know, <coughs> with uh, the same, you know, basically the same level of technology. Um, not to mention the fact that it was multitasking, that it did automatic configuration, that we had a real operating system, not like a Commodore 64 style operating system where stuff could, ch stuff could change and evolve. And it was, I think it was the single biggest jump in technology you ever saw in, in, in the, you know, the home computer market going from, you know, IBM PCs and, and um, you know, and Ataris and whatever else had been out, Commodores. It, when the Amiga came out, it just, it blew everything else out of the water. Um, you know, Macintosh, whatever. It was, you know, the, the, you know, the technology behind it was just that much more advanced. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't perfect. There were a few, you know, the graphics stuff was a little bit too close to the metal. Um, so it was harder to change graphics compatibly, but, um, it really, I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was, it, you know, for the day it was revolutionary. And, um, you know, I, I could say that even before I ever got to work on it, <laughs> you know, when, when we got, when we first got samples of that at, at Commodore, I, uh, I really wanted one. I started, I read through all the, you know, that we had these original green ROM kernel manuals that you couldn't, you couldn't, um, uh, give out to anybody you had to sign for and Bill Hurd had signed out one. So. I read through that, and um, I mean, they were doing things. I mean, you know, when, when you first got this, they had animation primitives in the kernel, or in the, you know, in in the operating system, in the you know, in graphics library. But I mean, no one had ever done that before. Um, you know, as a built-in, they were, you know, they were they were thinking like two two or three moves ahead. Um, you know, where it's it's tough to find a company that moves one move ahead um, as far as the technology goes. I mean, it, you know, it, it, it was, it was the fastest personal computer you could get, even though the CPU ran a little bit slower because, um, you know, the graphics, you couldn't do graphics as fast as 
an Amiga 1000 until you got a 68,020 in there and you could use the barrel shifter for, for very fast bit operations. So, you know, it was, it, it was just, you know, it was that much more advanced. The video coprocessor, I mean, no, no one's really done anything quite like that. I mean, you know, you can look today and say, oh, yeah, I've got this NVIDIA in there with, you know, with, uh, you know, hundreds of array processors and, you know, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, that's, you know, the times have changed. Things, have, things keep advancing. And, of course, you know, graphics eventually got to the point where, you know, you had to only, only specialized company works on graphics, right? You know, back then, every, every company that made a, uh, um, made a computer probably had something to do with the graphics that went into it. And even with, the, you know, even with the PC clones, I mean, you know, in the early days, you know, there were ver various companies doing graphics, and, you know, and, and as graphics got more and more sophisticated, fewer and fewer companies were actually able to compete. I see. Um, so, do you think, um, I mean, as far as the history goes, um, the Amiga stuff was was bought by Ascom, a German company, which died one year after. But um, in that year between, before they died, they they were doing interviews and publishing and so on, saying, we are going to reintroduce, to reproduce um, the Amiga computer, and it's going to compete with the PC. It's as at least as powerful and as at least as um, well as good to use, but it's more user friendly. Uh, do you think? Do you think if if Ascom wouldn't have died and the Amiga would would have still be around? that it would be able to compete with the PCs nowadays or that it would have evolved to compete so that we now nowadays would have like three systems not only Mac and PC but also an Amiga computer maybe uh, it's very possible i mean it's there's no reason it couldn't have with the right people behind it with the right amount of investment in the technology i mean that's really what it takes um, i you know <clears throat> i was actually working for um, for uh, Amiga Technologies as a contractor. I was, uh, when uh, in November of uh, 1995, I guess, they flew me and Andy Finkel out to Germany to talk to uh, Stefan Domeyer, who was the, uh, who was one of the two general managers at, um, at Amiga Technologies. <clears throat> and uh, we, uh, we, you know, we, 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 we talked, you know, found out what they wanted and proposed Making a portable Amiga operating system that could run on any microprocessor, um, they they were really looking for, to make something in like the A500 class that was going to cost give you the performance of a PC for much less money, um, and I think that was probably the right you know especially for the European market that was that was the one that would you know you know they never sold that many Amiga 3000s and 2000s over over in Europe but they but the 500 and the 1200 had done extremely well so so yeah I you know. And if you know the the operating system was flexible enough that it could it could have easily competed against a Macintosh and Windows if you you know if you put the right development behind it and kept it evolving because you know none of those stand still and but I mean if you look at you know look at some of the things that are happening at the end of Amiga um, even at Commodore um, I know uh, there was a project to add PostScript to the operating system where you're going to be able to open a window. And basically declare it a PostScript window, and you'd just put your PostScript in there, and it would display the you know display the whole thing. So we weren't going to go all the way that Apple did and use PostScript for everything because it's pretty inefficient for just drawing, you know, just drawing screens. But for things that need very very accurate placement, using this you know the same Im imaging model on screen that you use on the printer would have made the Amiga you know perfect for de desktop publishing, better than you know as good as the Mac ever was, and better than the PC. Um, in general, I mean, I guess it depends on what you're running on the PC now. Um, you know, there, there was another project to, uh, you know, to fix the graphics issue so that we could run Amiga graphics on anything. Um, we had had a Commodore, the last, the last project that was being worked on, um, after AAA, we had this architecture, uh, Dr. Ed Hepler was our main graphics guru and he had this, he had this thing, um, called Ombre, which was a completely different architecture. It was Amiga-like, and it would have been really good for games, but it was not compatible. But at that point, we were supposed to have graphics that could run on anything, and that would have been that 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 would have been powerful enough to use for workstation cl class graphics at that time. Um, so I, you know, I don't know if Fescom would have kept doing the hardware. I mean, we we were talking um, when I was um, when I was consulting for them. We met with um, uh, you know some 
companies for looking for technology to make this real. Um, you know, we were we were talking to Motorola, we were talking to IBM. Um, you know, the idea then was we were probably going to use PowerPC. Um, you know, ten years later, you would have made a different decision. Um, I guess if that had all survived, it would probably be using uh, x86 architecture, just like everyone else does, because you know you get to the point where it just doesn't make sense to try to compete, and the microprocessor doesn't count that much. No one really cares what the instruction set is. No one's writing assembly anymore. Um, they're really, really good compilers. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was already at Commodore that this, the 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 what would have been the Amiga 4000 if Commodore hadn't started falling apart, and certainly the Amiga 5000 was going to be using a different, you know, different system architecture where things were going to get more modular, we were going to use the PCI bus, we were going to do a lot, you know, we were going to use a lot of the standards. I mean, Commodore, you know, the Amiga stuff never intentionally reinvented the wheel, unlike Apple and some of these other companies. We, we tried to use the technology that was available because we wanted to spend our time doing the stuff that nobody else was doing right rather than just reinventing the wheel. So, you know, that's why we had a regular serial port and a regular parallel port on the Amiga 1000. And, you know, in places where there was an existing technology that worked, we were working on it. And I had actually been working um, in 91. I had been designing a new expansion bus that was going to let us do CPU modules better. That was the main goal. And um, the, the it turned out that the PC people, which this just kept happening, because when I was working on, when I was working on the Zorro 3 bus, the PC industry was working on the eISA bus, doing exactly the same thing I was doing, only in their own, you know, for for their own technology. And um, then when I started working on this Amy bus, um, they they came along and came out with PCI, and I looked at the two and said, um, PCI is probably a little bit better, and everyone's going to support this because it's that good. And sure enough, they did. Everyone supported it. So you know, some things would have changed. Some things would have gone to more standard forms, um, but I think the operating system could have survived. I really think that, you know, if, if, it, if Commodore had died maybe five or ten years later, um, they might have had the, you know, so, somebody, you know, or, or uh, SCOM, somebody would, might have had the, the clear sense to put the software out in uh, open source, but unfortunately it becomes, you know, if it becomes an asset, then you're trying to sell it, you're not successfully selling it, and then it just kind of, you know, I mean, it, you know, oh yeah, they're, you know, it was licensed, it was bought by Gateworks, um, who, I mean, who owns them now, Asus, um, and it was licensed to this Amiga group that these people have really done nothing, um, you know, I mean, they're, they're still, I think they're, they're still talking about stuff, but I mean, you know, when it take when you, when you basically take longer to do a release than it took to write like five versions of the Amiga operating system, um, <laughs> you know, it, by, from the original company, that tells you that nobody's working, nobody's very serious about getting this done, getting something out there. And, you know, you lost all momentum. I mean, there's, you know, it's, you know, if they put it out, no matter what, no matter how they put it out now, I don't think, I don't think anyone's, you know, anyone but a, a real enthusiast is going to play with it. Yes, it's true. It's still on sale nowadays at Amiga West. That's pretty true. Um, and and I remember there were also Amiga CD and so on. And one one sentence I have heard a lot of times in my life was that Amiga and the Amiga CD and so on, this whole multimedia thing was too much ahead of its time in the moment you released it. So, so it was too much for people. It was maybe too early. What's your What's your opinion about that? Well, I, you know, the game, the gaming stuff was, you know, that's it's tough to say because the, you know, the, there hadn't been a there, ha, you know, there there hadn't really been a migration of gaming to a gaming platform like there is today. You know, you've got the, you know, the PS3 and the Xbox. And, you know, maybe PC gaming is less interesting than it used to be because you have to be a real enthusiast to want to do gaming on a PC. But back then, everybody did gaming on a PC or, you know, even, you know, Amigas, you know, they all did it on personal computers and they hadn't, you know, you know, maybe it was a little bit ahead of its time. I think the biggest problem was that, you know, the CDTV didn't do enough for the money that you spent on it. And I think that the CD32 actually corrected that. It was a better... It was a much better gaming platform, and it cost less. The problem there was just it was the end of Commodore, and um, they, they couldn't fill half the orders they had for them because Commodore had been in such bad shape that, um, you know, that they weren't, getting, they weren't getting good pricing on components. They were having to pay in cash. 
um, because their credit was really bad because they weren't paying their bills. I mean, there was just, you know, it's, 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 you know, I guess it's the, you know, the classic example of a vicious circle that, you know, that everything you're trying to do to get out of this hole is really just digging you deeper in. Ooh. Um, and so it was, you know, it was pretty sad the way that turned out, but, you know, I, I think there was potential for that. I think you also, um, the other thing you really have to do is, you know, every gaming platform needs, just like the computers in those days, every gaming platform needs some killer apps that are very, very, very heavily promoted. And I think that's the other problem that Commodore had is they never did that. Um, if you look at the, um, the one I know about, and there's probably more of these because you see, you know, you see gaming ads all the time, but um, when the Nintendo 64 was released, supposedly they spent almost as much money developing the first Mario game as they did developing the platform. And then they spent like $45 million on advertising the thing, which is more than they spent on both of those developments together. So if you look at, you know, here's the hardware and software development, and here's how much you spend on marketing to make that a successful platform, you can see the problem Commodore was in by really, you know, they had this great thing and they couldn't make that many of them and well, at that point, marketing would have helped anyway because they couldn't make that many of them. But you know, it's also possible that if they had come in and said, you know, we can make a hundred thousand of these, we have orders for two hundred thousand. Instead, we if they had come to you know the bankers and said we have orders for two million of these, um, you know, they might have gotten some loans. It might have gotten some you know some kind of you know because companies you know the investors would have wanted to make money. Um, you know, it's just that, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't know the economy of that that well, but it's, it makes sense to me um, that, you know, that, you know, that, you know, letting people know about the thing you're trying to sell would have helped. And, um, and Commodore, you know, the game, the gaming world changed too. I mean, gaming is now making more money than Hollywood. So, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, you know, it, it really did change. And I think they were kind of at the very beginning of that transform. So, you know, may, yeah, maybe some of it was a little bit too early and some of it was just not like I think the first CD TV wasn't could have been done better. Um, there was a cost reduced version of that that, that uh, Headley Davis designed um, that was, uh, you know, it was a big improvement. But again, that was that was really too late at, at Commodore and things were just starting to fall apart. Mm -hmm. So, you know, business wise. Yeah. Yeah. So you yeah. were all you are also selling as um, a video CD. For NTC and Paul, um, a, it's called, I think it's a dead virtual or something. That is, um, is a DVD containing a documentary video about the last day at Commodore. Okay, yeah, the deathbed vigil, the name of the film is The Deathbed Vigil and Other Tales of Digital Angst. And, uh, <laughs> okay, so that was, it's actually three days. Here's the story. <clears throat> This was in, in, in April, the, near the end of April in uh, 1994. And um, our bosses had basically said, we don't think the company is going to last. If you have an offer somewhere, take it. And I got nervous about that because I had, like, a ba I had a new baby. I had, you know, <laughs> I had a little kid. I had a house and a mortgage. So, you know, regular person stuff. I went out and lo I was looking around to see about other jobs. And I had an interview with a, a an interesting company in Texas called Mizar. They did multiprocessor systems for like image rendering and signal processing and things like that. It was it was kind of industrial computing like. Um, <clears throat> but the guy who the guy who was the uh, who was the chief over there, the, the the CTO or whatever, was looking. He he was having to do so much business that he wasn't getting enough technology done and he was looking for somebody to basically replace him as the technology guy and I went down there and I really liked the company and um, I was the best interview ever we wound up going to sushi getting totally drunk with uh, Saki going to a strip club um, all kinds of stuff this is not your typical job interview that was after the after the regular job interview we, we I think I was out until you know two or three in the morning um, they liked me let's say let's say um, they couldn't offer very much money and um, I also interviewed with Compaq at that same trip in fact I got Compaq to pay for most of the trip so I didn't have to send the bill to Mizar because they were a pretty small company and Compaq was this gigantic monstrous company and I couldn't figure out what anybody did there they I went I interviewed with their multimedia department and they seemed to have 20 people doing the job of like one person at Commodore so I wasn't very interested in working for 
for but anyway when, when i went out there my wife was not too interested in moving to texas but she said well bring the camcorder along and we'll and you know take some video of like houses and things so she could see what it was like so i did that and um i come i, I took the monday off I, I was coming in tuesday and we, you knew things were bad but when i got you know i so i i ha happened to have the camcorders and still in the car i didn't have any tapes so i went by kmart you know, big, big, uh, you know, discount store. And they, fortunately they had a couple eight millimeter tapes. Um, and I put them in my camp, put one in my camcorder and walked into the building and just said, you know, I should get some of this down on video in case I get fired today <laughs> or they shut the place down or whatever. So I just started going around filming and, um, next couple of days, I just kept doing that. Um, that day, that was the Tuesday, um, bef uh, you know, and, and, uh, you know, in the, in the film, the first day, they were where I gave basically gave the tour of the building to to my viewing audience. Um, I uh, I um, I you know I got upstairs and we found out that um, people were basically more than half the company was being fired. And the next day, um, we had a party for them, um, at, basically a lunch at, at our at our favorite restaurant, Margaritas. That's where everybody hung out at Commodore. Um, you know, outside of out working hours, and the lunch lasted until about eleven or twelve at night, and um, that was the that. So that's the second phase of that was when I was going around basically just asking people to say something to the camera about the whole, you know, the whole thing, and we all kind of knew why the company was going out of business, and it had nothing to do with engineering. Um, and the third one, okay, so that that was Wednesday, the the going away party. Thursday, I didn't shoot any video. Friday. Um, Mike Sins, who was basically our kernel guy on, on Amigo S at the time, was getting married on, on Friday. So most of Commodore was at his wedding. What we didn't find out about until the next day was after, the, after business hours, Commodore declared bankruptcy that day. But most of us didn't know about that because we, you know, we were having a good time at Mike's wedding, Mike and Teresa. And so um, it wasn't until the next day. That I actually saw this when I was I was going to uh, bring some beer to the because of because of uh, Commodore's troubles and everyone being in town uh, like a lot of ex Commodore people being in town for for Mike's wedding. Um, Randall Jessup was throwing a party which he called the Deathbed Vigil. You know because we we knew Commodore was was sick and we we weren't sure if it was going to live or die. But we you know we just wanted to all get together and kind of commiserate and and. Um, so it was it was kind of it's still kind of a shock to find out that day that Commodore had declared bankruptcy the previous night and when you know you see in the film when I'm walking into the into the uh, into Randall's party somebody had put up the the local uh, a clip from the Westchester newspaper which was talking about Commodore Commodore's bankruptcy and um, you know then there were a bunch of people there and so I was going around shooting video and um, I my, I brought my uh, my my son was uh, like three years old. I brought him to the party too, and when it's time to take him home, I gave Fred Bowen my camera, and um, Fred and I think Keith, Keith Gabrielski were were occasionally shooting some video, and then somebody found a tripod and they put it on the tripod and um, just started filming stories after that, and um, you know people would just get in front of the camera and tell a story, and um, I went I shot six hours of film or so video, you know. And uh, so I was just editing this into a home movie, um, kind of, you know, just because I had shot all this video. And my friend Dale Larson at the time was, uh, he had started a publishing company, a very small publishing company called uh, Intentional Assets Manufacturing. And he was doing, he was publishing Disk Salve, one of the programs I wrote, and he was publishing some, uh, some internet-based books as well as his own, he had done the the internet book about uh, Amiga and the internet, and um, he was one of, probably the first guy who who really, really, really got how important the internet was going to be. Who at least who I knew, um, and uh, he was uh, so he said he said you should put this out for the fans, you know, and um, so I uh, I kept trying to make it better. And I would, what I was doing was I, I gave a couple, I'd give a copy of the VHS tape to somebody who didn't know that much about Commodore and then have them tell me. And, you know, and my, my, I gave one to my dad and he said, you know, it's, he says, it's good, but I don't always understand what's going on. And so that's what got me to, what I, what I do is between scenes, 
I have these cut slides that basically tell the story of you know more detail about why Commodore went out of business. In you know, so that's so there's that mixed in with the uh, with the actual uh, just you know this this engine you know our, the the main engineering team and you know in our last few days around Commodore. And, you know, before and after the bankruptcy. So, you know, part, I mean, the main reason, you know, that it was good was that, it, you know, it's just, it, I mean, it's, it, it, the video quality is terrible. I mean, it's, it's a little embarrassing because I actually learned to do video later. Um, you know, I, I didn't have a steady cam or, a, you know, or a professional quality camcorder back then. I didn't have off-camera microphones. I mean, I would never think of shooting a video with the on-camera camera microphone today. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you live and learn. So, you know, and that was the, that was also, the whole thing was produced on an Amiga too, because I actually had friends, I had a lot of friends in, you know, in video at that point. Um, I, I was buddies with this guy, Joel Tesler, who did the video for uh, Miami Dolphin Stadium, who easily could have hooked me up with professional equipment or whatever, but I wanted to, I wanted to do, um, I wanted to do it on an Amiga as a person who really hadn't done a video project before. <laughs> it took a while, <laughs> and I got you know I did I did t I did accept a few handouts. I borrowed um, Great Valley Products had done this thing called G had called had called uh, TBC Plus, which gave me a time based corrector plus special effects. So I was actually able to use special effects on video, which you know was trivial. You can do that on any video editing program today, but back then you really couldn't. Um, audio was I had it I had a uh, I had a cassette deck and a mixer, <laughs> and I could I could. I could move between the pre-recorded sounds and the the tape, and I was doing tape to tape editing that was controlled by Scala, and it was actually it was actually an Amiga three thousand plus that I did the editing on, which never made it to market, but it was uh, there were, there were a couple of them. Um, that one actually I, I lent that one to a friend, and it got stolen unfortunately, but um, but anyway, that's um, that's the deathbed vigil, and it's uh, you can get it on Amazon. Now. Yeah. Yes, and and you, and you can buy it. I think it's possible to buy it from you still, right? Because I remember I was buying it from you. Yeah, I sold it for a while, but basically in the last year, I think I sold one copy. So I just, you know, it, it didn't. Uh, I think part of the problem was that you know, without any advertising, no, nobody, you know, the 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 set of people who knew they could get it from me ran out, and also it's just, it, you know, it's. You know, I I had problems getting. You know, I'd get real busy, and you know, it'd take you know a month or two to ship it to you, and occasionally orders got lost because it was going through PayPal, and PayPal wouldn't necessarily send me an email like they're supposed to, and so you know, I'd I'd go and check every couple months, but then you know, when you're only getting one order a year, you stop. You know, you get out of the habit of checking. So I don't actually make very much money on Amazon, but I was able to cut the price. Um, and it's you know, if if somebody want, you know, I, I really just wanted it to be out there. Um, you know, available for anyone who wants it. It wasn't like, you know, it's not like it's going to make me any money, but um, the, in fact, the, the DVD version didn't really didn't make much money for me, but what it did do is allow me to learn how to make DVDs and it paid for all the DVD schools. So it wasn't a waste. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully after the interview is going to be released on YouTube and so on and on, on, and on our homepage, yeah. that you will get a lot more orders on Amazon, hopefully. <laughs> If they want, yeah, it's, you know, I just, I just, you know, people interested in it, they can go and find it on Amazon. That's really, that's really the point. You know, it's, you know, I, it'd be nice, it'd be nice. I mean, it's beer money at this point. I could get more of this great Hawaiian beer, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, it's not, it doesn't make much difference. And, you know, um, at some point I may put it out. I, you know, this was my last chance with the DVD. It's, um, there's, there were, there were some issues with putting it out on Amazon. It, you could, today you could probably do it. Originally, Amazon had limits, and so I actually there's a 10 minute trailer on there for anyone who hasn't seen it. You can go to Amazon and see like a you know a, a, it's called the uh, Deathbed Vigil extended trailer, and it's like 10 minutes of the movie, so it it gives you a pretty good idea what the movie's like and just how bad quality it is. Because ah. again, you know, I didn't want I didn't want to. In fact, I actually had to convince the uh, the um, Amazon it, Amazon's publish on demand system works through a company called Create Space, which is owned by Amazon, and it basically it's a model where you can, you know, it's it's made on demand, just like when I was making the DVDs myself. That they don't they don't stock it; they just make it when it's ordered. And you can they can do that with books and other stuff too. And it's pretty cool because if you, you know, it's if you want to self publish something, you can do that and get it put through the biggest mail order place on the planet. That doesn't suck. It's uh, <laughs> you know, it's pretty good. Um, it's uh, you know, and and uh, 
you know, it's it's that's kind of you know that's sort of the end. That's sort of the last stage in the in the revolution that Commodore really started. If you want to look at it this way, that you know, once I can make my own music on a computer, once I can make my own video on a computer, and um, you know, and I can create something like a movie from scratch using just my computer and my imagination. I still have to be able to get it to people, and it's kind of difficult to publish it yourself because it's a lot of work and you're not making any money at it anyway. But you know, it, but you know, if you could, you have something like this that sort of solves that problem. I mean, the internet really does too. It, you know, without the internet, I never would. You know, I would have had the you know the sales that we got at computer shows, and that was about it. So. You know this this whole idea of you know of being able to publish your own materials has really um, you know it's really come full circle and that's why you see uh, you know artists like Radiohead and Nine Inch Nails can you know can basically they don't have to go through record company anymore. If I that, remember you know, correctly, yeah, yeah, sorry, go, go um, ahead, co yeah. continue if you want to say so. Sorry, I... no, I'm I'm good. Go okay, um, okay. one thing <laughs> was. There was a, a second DVD enclosed with it, with uh, videos showing you and Bill Hurt presenting some of the Commodore parts and computers you produced back then. And I remember yeah. you were telling me you you are you are thinking about maybe making a new DVD in the future at some point. I had a project going for a short time. I, I kind of gave up on it just because I couldn't find it. I, I couldn't find enough commoner shows that I had time to visit, or, or you know, ancient. But yeah, I, I like the idea of making a film about um, retro computing. Basically, of you know, because I, I kept getting invited to all these commoner events and you know, like or you know, or or other retro computing events. Like there's a there's a uh, there's a computer museum up north of me here. Um, about an hour um, where they have, you know, they have computers that go way, way back um, and they have events every year. In fact, I'll, I think I'll be speaking there this year. Um, and, and, you know, it's, they have, they have, you know, ancient mainframe computers all the way, you know, through the, through the Commodore era. And um, there are a lot of people, you know, you go to these Commodore events and there's a lot of people who are just really, really dedicated to, you know, their 8-bit computers. And, you know, that's kind of interesting because most people don't know that exists, that anyone's still using these old computers or why they're using the old computers. Then it occurred to me that that would make a pretty interesting story. Um, you know, I just, I haven't really had the time for it, but I, I haven't, you know, it's not, it's not like I've really given it up. I just haven't, you know, I just haven't, haven't had the opportunity to um, get a lot, you know, you, you, you're going to need, you know, Probably for some for a documentary project like that, I'd probably need a good ten or fifteen hours of video to make something that was compelling enough to put to produce. So you need more maybe motivation, more. more motivation, more well, emails, more people wanting it from you. So maybe it will materialize. Well, that. <laughs> maybe that. If you look at if you if you look at the uh, Viva Amiga project that's been going on for several years now, where he's trying to make a uh, Zach Weddington is trying to make a professionally produced. Um, uh, video about the Amiga a documentary, just just following the Amiga, and he's he's um, you know he's raised money, he's flying over the country, he's you know it's not his full time job, but it gets to be a pretty big job, and um, so you know if you want to do it, he's also a uh, he's also a professional video guy anyway. He works at Comcast, and um, so he's you know that's that's the kind of thing that would you know it'd be nice to do, but you know between various other projects, I just haven't had the time for it. Um, yeah, people can write. People can ask for it. We'll see. <laughs> I would like to make another film at some point. Um, so let me ask you, how does it feel for you to, to be such a known man in the business and um, to know that you, that you are kind of a pioneer um, producing and um, being a hardware interview, uh, sorry, a hardware engineer back then? Um, how, how does it feel for you? Or do you not really consider yourself famous or well known to the te technology world? What's your own What's your own view about that? Um, you know, I don't think I'm all that well known outside of you know. I, I guess I got to be fairly well known in Amiga circles, and part of that's just because I used to write a lot and and answer questions online, you know, on on, on Usenet and stuff. So you know, a few of us did. A few of us got to be famous just because you know I I. I, you know, I mean, you could look at it as like we were being nice to the fans, but it was also, I learned a lot about, 
you know, how people use the computer. And I think that made me better at making a good computer is, you know, is knowing how it's going to be used, who's using it, you know, what they're looking for, things like video slot, you know, that, I mean, there's a lot, just a lot of stuff that you want to know. And there's so many people who don't have that connection with, you know, with, with the people who are using their systems. And, you know, I mean, you know, I, I don't know about, you know, whether Apple does anything like that. I mean, maybe they have study groups there, you know, they're such a huge monster these days. They probably, uh, you know, they pro they can probably afford that sort of thing, but I, I kind of like the you know that you could you could have a one to one relationship with a lot of the people who were involved, and you know I know I, you know I don't know if you know if that was fame you know a little bit of fame twenty years ago. It's I'm not sure it really does much today, but um, you know it was nice. I mean I was really glad to be part of it. I wouldn't have changed anything except for maybe Commodore not going out of business. <laughs> I mean you know. I was I was happy doing it. I don't think I would have left Commodore and gone to startups if they had stayed around. I was perfectly happy there. And, you know, they paid me okay, but it wasn't making me rich. But it was nice. You know, I got to do what I wanted to do. I got to make the computers I wanted to. And that was really, you know, it was a lot of us probably felt the same way that if, you know, you, you would have done this job for free if you could have, you know, if you were wealthy or something, you know, it, it was, you know, it was in, I, it, there haven't been that many jobs like that. Um, so, you know, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm really grateful to the fans that, you know, that made that possible for me to have that for 11 years. Because if you hadn't been buying my computers, I would have, I would have had to go look for work sooner. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, and I wish I wish we could have kept going. I, I did try. I tried at Amiga Technologies. I tried with uh, with um, Pius Computer, which was the the kind of the spinoff of Amiga Technologies where we were we were trying really hard to get the rights to use Amiga operating system and do, and do what, uh, what Amiga technology didn't do. Um, but that was, that was, you know, after, after SCOM went out of business, that was a huge mess there. Um, you know, the Amiga, I think <coughs> it's kind of funny that among engineers, the debtor commoner got the more respect the Amiga got. Cause when the Amiga was out, everyone said, Oh, it's a game machine. And they thought that was a bad thing until maybe the nineties when games kind of drove, the evolution of the IBM PC because PC compatibles didn't really need to be any faster for your office. So it was the gamers who were really pushing the architecture. You know, the reason that you made a, you know, the reason that you can, that Intel could sell a faster processor was, you know, scientists and gamers, not office workers. And the reason that you needed NVIDIA and ATI to make, you know, huge, huge, powerful graphics processors was for the gamers. So, you know, I think part of it is part of the reason I'm not me specifically, but why, why um, Amiga is seen as, you know, a, a positive pioneer in this, even though at the time, most people ignored it, most, you know, most people in the computer industry ignored it, is that um, that proved to be the right answer, that if you're building a machine that can do games well, it does everything else well. <laughs> mm -hmm. I kind of knew that back then because, uh, you know, all the stuff that and the other thing I was trying to do with it. Well, video, video is another big one. You need all the part, all the CPU cycles you can possibly get to do video. Um, back then doing, you know, uh, you could a lot of what you needed to do music on the computer or other multimedia was also pushing the envelope. You know, it was making a faster computer because, you know, once you once you had a computer that was fast enough to do recording on, now you start to do signal processing. So today I was just, I was just, uh, I just released a, I did a product, I produced an album for uh, my, my sister's band. And, um, uh, you know, I've got a, you know, a professional studio equivalent of equipment, but it's all on my computer. <laughs> you know, I've got, you know, mixers and, you know, and, and, and um, compressors and, and uh, all kinds of, you know, all kinds of stuff that used to be hardware you had to put in a rack somewhere and pay thousands of dollars for. Um, you know, and that's, and it's all CPU cycles and it, you know, I mean, these days, like, I mean, you know, people are, people are running out of uses for CPU cycles. I think mostly like, you know, I'm, I'm doing this interview on a tablet. I don't actually need a computer. I mean, well, it is a computer, but I don't need, I don't need a PC. I don't need something that's at that scale. It works just fine on Android. Um, then again, um, you know, the, the Android's running the same kernel or a similar kernel to what you find on supercomputers too. So even that's kind of a little bit skewed. Um, but you know, back to back to you know, fame and fortune. Well, I didn't really get the fortune, but I we, I did okay. Um, you know, <laughs> it was uh, you know, it's nice. It's nice to be well thought of. 
And, you know, and I hear, you know, every once in a while I hear about some, somebody who went into engineering because, you know, because of their experiences with, you know, following Commodore and, you know, and, you know, looking at the stuff we did when, when they were kids. And it's like, well, you know, that's, you can't have much better compliment than that. You know, okay. if, you, if you help change somebody's life for the better, you know. <laughs> that's true. Um, so do you still, do you still stay in touch with what people from Commodore back then do nowadays i mean are you staying in touch with michael tom Shack and all the other guys like bill hurt and so on or shack paddle are you still in touch with them well i didn't really know Ch mike tom Shack or chuck paddle they were a little bit before my time but yeah i, I mean bill hurt i you know we, we we trade emails every now and then um we're on facebook <laughs> the same thing everybody else does with all their old friends um, you know, I see postings from Mike Sins every, you know, every once in a while. Um, I, you know, and every once in a while par parties, I, I went to a, uh, I went to a Commodore, um, actually we had a, we had a Commodore reunion last summer at Greg Berlin's house. And, uh, you know, that, that was actually, Mike Tomchek was there. That was, that was a real big one. That was, uh, that was the biggest one we'd had in a while. We, we, it wasn't one of the, it was, it, it had the advantage of actually being planned out a month or two beforehand rather than just like, Hey, let's have a party this weekend. <laughs> And um, so that was pretty good. It was catered, and, and um, that was a lot of fun. Um, so, you know, I try to keep in touch with them as much as possible. I mean, if I was starting a company, those might be some of the first people I'd like to see. Hey, what are you guys doing these days? But, um, you know, it's, I, you know I, haven't, I haven't been inclined to uh, start a company any t you know, recently. But you never know. There might be another one. If, you know, you have to have a good idea. Maybe maybe you could develop your own, your next computer, your next competitor, a competitor to PC. <laughs> Who knows? Well, I actually thought about you know. In fact, somebody's doing this, but I thought it might be interesting to just you know to like write a book that follows developing a computer from scratch. You know, we're gonna we're gonna start with de designing the CPU and then designing the operating system and all. You know, going through from from the beginning. Um, you know, as an instruction, but also there, you know, when you're done, you have a computer that makes for a good hobby, you know, experimenter's computer. Um, that's something that's kind of starting to catch on again. You know, like the Raspberry Pi is an experimenter's computer, right? They, they made that. They just wanted to make something cheap that people could play with. And they were totally blown away with the fact that they're now people are buying thousands of these things. Um, you know, a $25 computer. Um, you know, so I don't know. I've, I've, I've sort of kicked a few ideas like that around. Um, I know I I actually in my last my last job and this current one I've learned the last part of it that I didn't know about was RF design so I could actually even put in a uh, you know I could build in an RF network or something and like that and do even do that in software wouldn't be very good but see part of the problem of course is that you know a, a custom CPU these days like I mean you'll, you know if you're really trying to make your own CPU you know you, um, people pay about um, the, this this uh, tablet runs a Nvidia Tegra three. They cost about fifteen dollars when you buy them in a million quantity. Um, you can't really make a good CPU on your own for fifteen dollars. You know, it's it, it. So it's not. You know, it's not like you're going to. It's not like you're likely to find somebody coming up with a with a next Amiga in a garage somewhere. But if you wanted to make something that was cool and fun to play with, it kind of. You know, it's a different level. It's not. You know, you're not trying to sell a million of them, but you're trying to sell something that might teach people how to do computers. You know that. You know everything because I think, particularly when computers got better and better and better after a certain point, people stopped understanding how they worked. Like if you you know you ask any Commodore 64 user who's still around and they know every single thing there is to know about that computer, and I think that's why they still use it because they know the registers, they know the 6502 and the SID chip, they know you know they they understand that computer you know. Oh, well, you know, you, there's Jerry who understood it so well she made one, <laughs> you know, but, um, but people, you know, a lot of people have no idea how their PCs work and, you know, a lot of them aren't interested. They're just using it to do something else. Like, you know, when I, I mean, I know how my PC works, but when I go and use it to edit a video or to mix a album or to, you know, Skype or whatever, um, it's not, um, it, you know, it's not at the forefront of my mind how this works. It's just good that it does and it doesn't crash, which is, of course, one reason for doing Skype on Android and not on Windows. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you were, if you were, if you were doing computers again, what would you change nowadays? 
what would you improve maybe ah uh, that's that's you know if i if i had a really good idea i might start doing it i mean there you know it's you know you might you know i don't know it's it's hard to say what you could what you could really improve i mean you know they're pretty good and they're cheap um you know they get a little bit better every year and you know you you don't really think of keeping a computer for 10 years anymore i mean some people do um, and that's actually turning out to be a problem, right? Because the PC industry isn't selling as many as they used to because most people are happy with their PC already. They're not looking for a new one because the current one does the job because it's fast enough and doubling the speed of the average person's computer won't benefit them much. So I'm not really sure what you do. I mean, I like the idea of mobile computers just because like I can take this tablet and use it for, a, I had it in a meeting um, a couple weeks ago. It, it was an 11 and a half hour meeting. And I didn't have to plug in. I mean, that's a big, you know, that to me, that's, you know, if I don't need the super computing power of my desktop, um, you know, I was just taking notes on the computer. Now, I could have used a pad of paper, honestly, but it's nice. You know, I like to do it on the computer because then, first of all, I don't lose them. <laughs> Secondly, I can make copies for everybody right away. And I just, you know, I'm terribly unorganized out in the real world and I'm extremely well organized in cyberspace you know all my computer stuff is like I know I can find anything on my computer like that um, but my desk yeah there's there's just stacks of crap I don't know what's in there <laughs> so um, you know so I you know I really do like the idea of mobile computing um, you know I like the idea of making making things easier for people to use you know to tap the power of the computer but um, you know, a lot of those are very, very big questions to answer, not something that you can do on an individual basis. And, you know, I get, like I said, if I, if I, if I had the actual idea for what would be the gr next greatest thing, I think I would put it out. Um, I did actually buy, I, I found something kind of interesting online and, um, there's a Kickstarter project going, um, for what, for what this people are calling a personal supercomputer. And what they're doing is they're making a computer, um, that is, uh, it's just, it's, it's like, it's going to run Android. It's going to have an ARM processor in there, but the ARM processor is connected to this, or this huge floating point array processor. It's like an eight by eight array of floating point engines. And I'm kind of wondering what that's going to turn into something like that. We're now we're starting to, you know, once, cause think about this. I mean, once you got the CPU pretty well down, then the GPU came along and graphics got, you know, the graphics that you can do on a NVIDIA these days or an ATI, um, would have taken, you know, months with a room full of Amigas to do that same rendering that, that, that one of these can do in real time. And now that, you know, now we're starting to use those for computing. That's changing the kinds of things that you can do. You know, the question is, is that ever going to be interesting to the average person? Like, you know, I like, if I can get my video to render twice as fast, that's great because then it takes, you know, I could put out, a, you know, I could get my movie done in, you know, in three hours instead of six hours. And that, that makes a big difference to me. But, you know, most people are never going to use that much computing power. You know, if you're, you know, if you're a gamer, if you can have, you know, 20,000 alien ships swarming to attack your spaceship rather than, you know, 10,000, it makes for a more compelling, and you know, game. Um, you know, it's the virtual environment kind of thing. Um, I guess that's another one that I'd like to see, but I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a simple problem to solve is to, you know, is, is more, you know, more and more averse to virtual reality. You know, if, if they start, if they start, if they start being able to hook the computer into the brain, I think I'd go for that, but I wouldn't want it to be running Microsoft software. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of just imagine your whole brain getting a blue screen of death. <laughs> or Kuro running. <laughs> like on the Amiga. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't want that either, no. <laughs> I, think um, I, I think I might have had a, I might have had the occasional guru meditation error in my brain from time to time. <laughs> um, so speaking about that, you said that uh, most people don't own their computer for 10 years or something. Um, there is actually um, some, there are some theories about how long the Commodore stuff is going to be still alive. I mean, people yeah. say that the average lifetime of an old computer is like 40 years. That would mean that in 10 years or something, many Commodore computers would just stop working. Um, but, but of course, it's also interesting to notice that a Commodore computer, might it be Amiga or C128 or C64, it's really 
almost undestroyable. I mean, it it runs, it runs, it runs. I mean, sometimes you have to fix or exchange a zip chip or something, but you can always fix it that it works in a way. So, what do you think? Do you really think it's it's going to to be all dead by ten years because the hearts are uh, the parts are going bad? I'm not really sure. I mean, there's, you know, there are a bunch of things that can make parts go bad. I mean, if you're getting corrosion, if the circuit board's breaking down, just mechanical failures. I mean, that happens to, that can happen to anything, but it's not guaranteed to happen. Um, you know, it depends on how the computer's being stored. If you're running a really, really hot processor, like most PCs, there's this phenomenon called electromigration, where you basically, the chip will eventually die. But most Amigas don't run hot. So I don't I don't see that happening. Um, you know, there if you you know if you've got the sixty eight thousand forty board in there, it's running pretty hot. But uh, most of them didn't run that hot. You know, we didn't need heat sinks on the sixty eight thousand thirties. You know, so um, you know I don't I don't think that's a problem. Um, so I would say I would say there's no guarantee. I mean, if you've got EEPROMs, that's that's something to worry about. If you're if you've got it like an Amiga three thousand that shipped with the EEPROMs, um, those are supposed those are those are supposed to be good for ten years. They might last longer. They might not. Um, regular ROMs and regular chips don't really have a, it, it, you know, they don't really have an expiration date. Um, there are various things that can cause them to die, but they don't have an expiration date. Power supplies tend to burn out after time. Um, not guaranteed to, but they, you know, they they run hot and they have a tendency. Uh, the the actually the the only thing um, back when I was using my Amiga t uh, 2000 on a daily basis I had a problem with the power supply after like five or six years but I was I was already upgrading to an Amiga 3000 so it didn't matter but I, I kept that one around for a while and then I think I eventually gave the parts to somebody else and let them fix it um, in fact I just got I just got another my sister's selling her Amiga 2000 I gotta figure out what to do with that but she hasn't used it in a long time she's got Macintoshes <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah. But yeah, I you know I I don't think there's I I you know it's it's hard to say, and I guess it, you know it'll be something where we can tell if this is true or not. But I mean, think about this too. That you know you know um you know the Commodore sixty four is that you know they say there's one in every closet. I mean, even if some of them die, you there's probably a, there's probably going to be enough of these around for everyone who wants them for. You know, I would say the foreseeable future, unless it really does hit a cliff. But, you know, I'd say it's something I don't expect it to happen, but we don't really know. Okay. So it will be a big, a big surprise for, for everybody when when most of the devices will die. But then we still have the computers like the DTV or the Commodore 1 or the emulators. Um, so let yeah. me ask you, um, what's your opinion about the... the um, expansion hardware you got from like CMD that super CPU which which even got released at the SSC 128 version and um, especially think uh, since uh, CMD arcade didn't didn't produce them anymore after they took over from CMD um, they they are well they are like casting Four thousand dollars. Last time I saw it on eBay for a super CPU that is still working. What's what's your opinion about this this super hardware that um, new hardware that CMD did back then? Well, I mean, I think that I, I actually like the idea that that people were producing new hardware for old Commodore computers. I mean, it's you know because as long as you've got people who are using it, you know, like. You know, I, I, it struck me, and I, you know, I knew about a bunch of these, about accelerators and other things. It struck me one year, um, less than 10 years ago, I was at a computer show, and every Commodore 64 user there was running all of their programs off of a flash drive. And it's like, oh, yeah, because you could probably fit every Commodore 64 programmer ever written on a flash drive. Why would you, you know, they never even needed the hard drive, you know, they, you know, so, yeah, and that's something that didn't exist back when the, back when Commodore was alive, flash memory barely existed. It did, but it was just, it was just coming out at the end of Commodore. Um, the only computer that ever had support for flash on it was the, um, the AAA board. Um, the motherboard was called Nix, NYX, and the, the, instead of having socketed ROMs, I had ROM on a DIM module, which we should have done like 10 years earlier, but nobody thought of it. 
Um, so if you wanted to upgrade your ROM, you didn't have to pull sockets and things. You just you plugged in a DIM module, and the DIM module had a 12 volt supply on it, so that you could because back then to program Flash, you needed 12 volts. Um, very very early Flash um, needed needed high voltage to uh, program it. So we had the we had the ability. It, and you could, you could run a regular ROM too, but it would also be able to use Flash, um, and that was uh, um, yeah, you know it was like in you know eighty um, ninety two ninety three, um, so you know but I mean going back to the uh, going going back to the um, add-ons, I mean I like the idea. It's it's tough because what you have to realize is if you know there's still it's still a pretty small market. So if you're making something. You can't make that many of them. You can't get really good prices on components if you're not making that many of them. Um, it's just, you know, it's going to cost you a lot more to do a small run of something than it is a large run. Plus, if you're trying to be a real company and not just a hobby, um, you have to you have to sell it at a high enough price to, you know, basically pay for your cost of, you know, your salary and everything else. And, you know, and that's really hard to do. So, you know, it's not surprising that some of these things came out fairly expensive. Now, if they're going for crazy prices on eBay, that's just a collector's market thing. You know, it's <laughs> I just read a friend of mine, a friend of mine from college sent me a, uh, a, a note, a, a link last week about a, a, a C65 that sold on eBay for like seventy five hundred dollars. And it wasn't even functional. It was missing half the chips. But it was just that, you know, there is a collector's market. Um, last year, I had a uh, I had. I was my I was cleaning the garage and I found this box of stuff from Commodore that was probably just going to get thrown out and then I said well I should put this out there um, and uh, let collectors let, yeah let, well let collectors have it because it's like you know I it doesn't nothing there was <coughs> particularly valuable to me a lot, but there were you know there were like you know some some proto boards that we had for uh, for developing the Amiga three thousand and a few other things like that. And then I went down in my basement and said, I've got all this other stuff that's just sitting in a box somewhere that, you know, I mean, it was nice. But, you know, I, I had a mentality at Commodore that by the time something was done, okay, I had my new toy for home that I could program. But as far as the hardware was concerned with, it's like, okay, I already know what I don't like about this because I've been, you know, by the time the Commodore, by the time the Amiga 3000 was out, let's say, I had been living with it for over a year developing it. And I was ready for the next thing. So I don't really, you know, I don't collect computers. I didn't really form, you know, I, I, I mean, the, the Amiga 3000, I think, was probably the best thing I worked on there. The Commodore 128 was one of the best projects, too. Um, you know, I still have a Commodore 128. I still have an Amiga 3000. I, I didn't keep any of the others. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, you, you know, I, I kind of build, you know, I, I think of it, too, that if I build something that works... I want people to use it, so um, I, don't, I never really hung on to anything that I wasn't using, and the, so the only stuff I had was broken, or you know, or prototypes or stuff like that. But you know, a lot of people I actually I actually put some up and raised mo uh, money for a charity. Um, uh, I took some of the money, and the rest of it went to the charity, um, and uh, um, it was you know it was kind of surprising what people were willing to pay for this stuff. So, you know, it doesn't surprise me if you say, you know, somebody's paying $4,000 for something that goes on a Commodore. I'm like, yeah, there are people who will do that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, it's just, you know, it's a collector markets are like that. You know, what makes a baseball card worth $10,000 or a comic book? You know, it's the fact that somebody's willing to spend that much money to have it. it you know, there's no intrinsic value in any of this stuff really anymore. Because, you know, if you just, if you look at it from the point of view, of this is just, Computer computational hardware, you know, my smartphone is faster than anything that ever came out of Commodore, but you know, it's not, you know, it, it's different. It, you know, it, it, you know, because the smartphone I have this year will get thrown away sometime, and you know, a new one will come along, and I won't really care, you know, that much about it as long as it does the job. You know, I, you know, people seem to have formed more personal attachments to Commodore equipment, and I, I do understand that. Like I said, I still have a Commodore 128 and still have an Amiga 3000. Even though I don't really use them, I'm not going to get rid of them. <laughs> I see. So, is there anything you want to you want to say in the interview before we before we close it? Because this was my last question to you, actually. Okay. Um, no, not really. I'm just, you know, like I said, I, you know, I'd like to say thanks to everybody who's been a part of this whole thing, and you know, because it, you know, it really. 
you know, it's been it's been great for me, and I think most everybody else who worked on it, you know, it was, you know, we're, I mean, you know, considering, you know, I was thinking about that the other day. I was going up to uh, last night. I was going up to a um, to a, uh, a a music thing. I have a, a I'm in a in a music club at uh, up in Princeton, New Jersey, where we play. Uh, we 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 you know we get together and sometimes we jam and sometimes we just play music and and um. You know, it was a singer-songwriter night. So it's the night where you're supposed to play music that was written by, like, one person who then went and performed it. And um, I actually wrote, I had my own songs, and I wrote, I was debuting a new one that had never been played before. And I was thinking, like, you know, you know, I was actually thinking about the technology. Like, I spent all this time on technology, and, you know, most of that's just been completely replaced. Um, except that, you know, ex you know, art forms like, like music, might live, you know, a thousand years after you made that music. Um, but I think there's, you know, I think we try, you know, we, we made the computers, you know, in, in an artistic way. It's, you know, we made something that wasn't just like everybody else's that, you know, that, you know, that really, you know, we did something. I'm not even sure you can exactly say what, but I mean, you know, 20, 30 years later, people are still hanging on to these things. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I can't necessarily explain it. But I feel good about it, and um, you know, like so, I, uh, so, like I said, you know, I want to thank everybody for for continuing to be a part of that. Well, so thanks for for allowing us to interview you and having this nice interview and getting some information from you about this stuff. And sure. I, I hope I hope you will have um, well good projects in the future and good jobs. You can you can um, well realize your fantasies about engineering. Yeah. And so thank you again. And well, okay.